Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome in to the Camwood live session today. Hope everybody's having a great day. Still got a few people coming in, so we'll give everybody some time to join us. Make sure you guys can hear me. Trey will be joining us here in just a sec. There he is. Yeah, I should be should be on now. Yeah, you can you hear me? Yep. I got audio. Like we said, hope everybody's having a great day. It is Thursday, one more day during the week. Folks down south are already hitting the fields. We've been watching a few teams practice the last few days down here in Georgia. But as always, you know kind of the drill. If you've never been here to a Camwood live session, we basically open up this time, give you guys the opportunity to ask us questions about the 30-day program or the 60-day program, whatever part you're in. And uh, we provide a lot of feedback in regards to mechanics, uh, tips and tricks to help your players see the best results and make sure that they're doing the drills correctly. So if you have any questions, go ahead and either raise your hand and we'll unmute you so you can talk to us or uh, type your question in the chat box and we'll, we'll read it out to the group. Thank you to those of you that are taking advantage of the Camwood hotline too. That is a awesome tool that we have. How many of you guys are already starting up um, or your kids are already starting up their seasons right now? It's possible that we may have a lot of, a lot of people from up north. So I'm not sure kind of if all of you guys are getting ready to play. Some of you guys may be a little bit younger. I know a lot of the high school teams are hitting the field already. So I was wondering whenever the uh, the travel ball season started right, for youth yeah. players. I know, I know high school in Georgia started like last week, I think. Yeah. Colleges are getting wrapped up too. This guy's in New Jersey, still getting six inches or getting six inches of snow this weekend. Yeah. Um, <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. And that's why I live in Florida. <laughs> and right there. Folks starting in March in Missouri, got some folks in St. Louis. Here's a question right here from John Anderson um, saying he has an issue with one of his sons when he lows and steps into the pitch. He is striding way too much. Do you have a video or a suggestion on how to set up his base stance and load? Um, yes, we always really try to be real simple with, with the stance and the load. A lot of people notice that when we start the program, kids don't necessarily have a super athletic stance. We widen their feet out. We get them into their legs a little bit, but we really want to feel more like a tree trunk that's got roots in the ground and not a tree that's real heavy up top. Um, I had a girl in here yesterday, a softball player that we were working with, kind of the same thing, was having issues controlling her weight. When she'd pick her foot up, she'd get too much of a stride or she wouldn't get enough, stride, enough of her foot down and she'd be over her front side. Um, it's just really important that the player understands that in order for you to have solid contact with something, if I'm wanting to move this direction, at some point my, my momentum has got to be braced against something. And that's what our front side does, our front leg does. We don't really talk a lot to kids about using their front foot or their stride to gain ground because we don't want lateral movement towards the pitch in the swing. That's going to put you in a bad spot. So really the stride is just a balance position. We're just picking that foot up and putting it right back down on the ground and giving ourselves a good base to fire against so that all of our momentum can be torqued into that ball. Yeah, so I, I used to have that issue whenever I first started working with Frank. And um, what he did was he widened me out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So right. uh, my, my load, I, you don't want a bunch of moving pieces throughout the swing. So, you know, one of the biggest things out there is that like a huge leg kick. Uh, all you're doing is you're adding more elements to the swing that can go wrong, that can mess you up. And I promise you that leg kick is not going to increase as much power as you think it does. In my opinion, it just messes up your timing even more. So we, I, I try to be as simple as I could. And my focus of a load was, yeah, like load my weight back, 
pick the front foot up and put it right back down um, because I didn't want to have that movement and lunging towards the pitch. I didn't want the level of my head moving at all. Because you see a bunch of players that start straight up with a narrow stance. Whenever they stride out, their head moves from up here to down here. Okay, yeah. and that's going to change yeah. – you being able to see that ball coming in. So whenever I work with players, I try to make it as simple as possible. You know, it's just an athletic stance. We're parallel. We're not open. We're not closed. And we're trying to minimize things that can go wrong in the swing, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I mean, he says he agrees. He cannot get his knee drive when he's so wide. And that's, I mean, that's true. We tell our players that too. You're losing uh, weight shift and you're losing rotation. A lot of folks, I mean, I say a lot of people, if you're not real – if you don't get a good understanding of what weight shift is, it'll confuse you for the rest of your life. A lot of people think weight shift is like the actual movement of your body. It's not. It's where we build that weight up. We load. When we load, all that weight is built up like in that knee, in that back leg. And so that's the only thing that's shifting is that part right there. And if you get too wide, if you get way out here on your front side, I mean, I'll back up so you can kind of see it. Um, but if you get too wide, get down on your front side, you're not able to get into – you get out here, you can't have any knee drive back here. All you're doing – everything's going down in the ground. It's so hard to get the ball in the air. Let's see here, another one. How would you suggest providing some additional help if young players are having trouble consistently moving their hands, especially on weight shift, pipe, also, I'm finding that the hip turn on the pipe isn't consistent. Knee behind the insider rod. Trying to find focal points to help each child with these two issues. Um, yeah, I'm going to read back through this and kind of start with the first question. Um, younger players consist uh, having trouble consistently moving their hands. I'm, I'm assuming that what you're saying is when they get to the lower half drills, they're probably having issues – with what their hands are doing and truthfully i mean it's this is is so simple but the reason that they're having issues with their hands is because they're thinking about their hands um if you if you ask them what you think about they're going to tell you i'm trying to get my bat to the ball they've got to stop thinking about what's up here um it's got to get to a point to where they're not holding this bat up but this bat is so loose and so relaxed and the only thing i'm focused on is what's happening underneath my body because again if we're loose up top and i get a firm foot in the ground when i fire my knee everything else in my body coming up is a whip through the ball so i've got to be able um talking about their hands going consistently um we've got to be able to get their hands to the pitch the right way the next question also I'm finding that the hip turn on the pipe isn't consistent. That's going to, I mean, it's not going to be consistent right off. How old are the kids that you're working with? No, you definitely ain't going to get an eight and 12 year old right away. I can promise you that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, took, it took me a while. I was in high school. It took me a while to get uh, consistent I have with this stuff. The softball player that we posted about yesterday, she was, I mean, she was struggling on, what was it? The pipe, weight shift, what was it yesterday? Uh, pipe drill. She was struggling on the pipe drill yesterday. And again, she's 17 years old. I mean, she's an athlete. And it's, her body's not there yet. Her muscles have not been trained and they hadn't stretched and loosened and whatever to get to where they can do it consistently. Um, that's why we reiterate and harp on the fact that you got to do this every single day because if you don't do it every day your body's not progressing it's not moving that way and it's not getting good muscle memory to be able to do it consistently and the big thing with me whenever we're doing these drills and and it's the reason that we isolate these drills you know whenever we're working on hands they're called no feet no shoulders because we don't want to use our shoulders and we don't want to use our lower half at all um and when we're doing these uh, the pipe drill and the lower half stuff, we want to focus on the lower half. So if they're struggling with, you know, firing the hands first it, uh, during the lower half drills, it's because they're worried about hitting the ball instead of what we're trying to focus on with that drill. So the mental side of the drill, they should only be thinking about the lower half when we're doing this. So when we're doing the pipe drill, only thing that they should be thinking about is loading 
and then rotating the hips first. And then the hands will naturally come through. We've already taught the hands, right? We did the hands in week one. So they already understand that part of it. So when we're working on the lower half, they should be focusing on the lower half. Okay. So when we're doing the weight shift drill, we're loading and we're seeing how hard we can drive that knee up first. That's the only thing I'm thinking about is how hard can I drive that knee up first? And then the hands will come through. Same with the pipe. We're loading. I'm seeing how hard I can rotate my hips and then the hands will follow through. Does that make sense? So if they're having issues yeah. with it, it's because they're probably not thinking about it the right way. We want them focusing on what that one drill is teaching them. Yeah. Good. Right here, two weeks in, my 10-year-old has a has already seen five miles an hour um, on his exit velocity measured by a radar gun. That's awesome improvements. Very good. Just two weeks that's in. A- that's like an extra 20 feet. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, four teams doing the Canwood program. All are hitting the ball harder. Big question is, would you warm up before games with Canwood or just swing in the on-deck circle? Um, no, we would absolutely warm up. I know I, I coached high school for three years, and if I would have continued coaching, we would have been doing – we would have done nothing but swing at Canwood until we got ready to step in the box. The first thing that I would have players do when they show up to the field is get their one-handers, two-handers, weight shift, and pipe drills in. You don't have to have, I mean, four buckets of 28. Take, I mean, five, six, seven one-handers, six, seven two-handers, weight shift, pipe, get your body loose, get everything moving so that now when I go to a game bat and I get ready to take BP or I get ready to go to a game, now my body's ready to fire the right way. A lot of times folks will train, 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 and then get to a game and then just go in the cage and hit with their game bat and hit with their game bat, and they never loosen their muscles up properly and get them ready to do what they've trained them to do. So now they're being counterproductive. Yeah, like I said, my routine before games, before practice, I would go into the cage and I would do these the four core drills every single day, okay? So – it doesn't have to be a bucket of each drill. It can just be to where we're getting consistent, okay? So if I go into the cage right before a game, you know, I do 10 one-handers, and they're good and they're consistent, okay, I'll move on to the next drill. And then I'll do, you know, eight to 10 swings of that. Once that's consistent, we'll move on to the next, so on and so forth. And then once I'm ready, you know, once I've warmed up, I've got everything working the way it's supposed to, um, right before I go up to the plate when I'm on deck, I'll take my cam wood out on deck. I'll do about three or four no feet, no shoulder swings first just to get, you know, just to teach myself staying inside the ball. And then I would take about two or three full swings with the cam wood. And then I would pick up my game bat and go to the plate. So every single game, if you ever watch me in college or anything like that, you will see that I'm on deck with my cam wood every single game right before I go to the plate. Very good. I hope that answers your question there. Um, another one here, I have an impatient 12-year-old. We do too. We have a lot of them. What are the biggest goals for him that should uh, that he should focus on besides being more patient and following the program? I'm going to ask you a few questions. Number one, where is he at in the program? Um, based, I mean, what week is he on? And then I would say that he's really got to start being specific. He's kind of – my guess is that he's probably struggling with the fact that this is weird, this is different, it doesn't feel right, I don't want to really do this because – I, my way of swinging is more comfortable. This is going to be uncomfortable until we train our muscles to do it that way every time. So we've got to accept the fact it's going to be uncomfortable and then get into the specifics. The one hand drill. What am I specifically trying to do? My hand's trying to drive that way. I'm trying to pull the knob of the bat past the ball. And in order for me to do that, some things have to happen. I can't go this direction. I can't pull off my front shoulder. I've got to have this move, everything that's connected to the bat has to move in a straight line past the ball. And then he needs to try to perfect doing that. One-handers and one-handers and one-handers, moving into two-handers and then into his weight shift pipe, following the program along. He's going to see a lot better results a lot faster that way because his focus is in the right place. He's not so much worried about the uncomfortability, why it doesn't feel weird or why it feels weird, why the bat's heavy, all that kind of stuff. It's going to be all of those things. Bat's going to be heavy. It's going to be uncomfortable. But we've got to put the focus on the right place. Trey talks about it all the time. What you're thinking about 
is very, very crucial when you start going into this program and into the drills. I would say the mental side of it is probably 90% of what these drills are. I mean, literally, a pl- I could be working with a player and the mechanics aren't right during these drills. You know, he's coming around the ball uh, and stuff like that. And all I got to do is just switch what he's thinking about while doing the drill. So I'll ask him, you know, what are you thinking right now? And a lot of the players say, well, I'm just thinking about hitting the ball. I was like, all right, well, on this swing right here, what I want you to think about is relax the hand. And I just want to see how far you can drive the knob past the inside of the ball towards the pitcher. That's it. That's all I want you to think about. And miraculously, it's a line drive to right field, which is exactly what we want to the opposite side. So, you know, just switching their mental while they're doing the drills uh, will fix the issue, I'd say, seven out of ten times, if not more. So if he's struggling with the stuff right now, it's probably because he's not focusing on the right things. Uh, during the drill and you said that it was during the uh, beginning of the program so it's probably the one hand drill he's going to be also he said struggling to get through the first few days yeah so I mean this is something he has never done before you know it's different it's brand new so what we need to do is uh I would uh, if you go into the program you'll see that there's a video talking about the mental side of this drill I would sit down with them and uh, have them watch this drill or have them watch that video of the mental side and um, really focus on it today when you do the drills or tomorrow whenever you do them. And you'll see a huge difference, I promise. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, too. I mean, that's something that a lot of kids, especially the younger they are, the more they struggle with it. They have to accept they've never done this before. They are not going to be good at it right off the bat. I mean, some kids are. Some kids, they. I mean, God did it. They were birthed with the natural ability to drive their hand in the right the right way but most kids were not I mean it takes time to get good at something so right off the bat first few days it's going to be tough it's going to be a tough mental battle it's going to be a tough physical battle but if you can get through the first week I'm telling you after that first week it starts getting extremely impressive with the, the amount of results that you're seeing the improvement in mechanics strength bat speed power all those things that we harp on all the time um, another question here. They're rolling in now. My boy six swings the bat with his arms. How can I get him to understand uh, the swing starts with the lower half? Um, truthfully, you've got to just repeat it. You've got to repeat it. Again, he's six years old, so you're not going to get too terribly far with talking specific mechanics and getting him to be able to follow you. I mean, for example, a 30, 40, 45-minute lesson. You're not going to get that out of a six-year-old. So you've got to just – harp on let's fire with our lower half have them slow down if they're just taking full swings with the cam wood or full swings with the game bat just tell them rest the bat on your shoulder and just feel your lower half drive to the ball i mean they can understand you a little bit they're six they're smart and then tell them to pick their bat up and do the same thing and take a full swing um you're going to get a lot farther with young kids with just words more so than anything else because they do understand you um They understand what you're saying. Um, My partner, Brian, sitting right here with his seven-year-old son, and he hits him here every day, and it's the same kind of stuff. I mean, he's talking about lower half. He's talking about keeping your hands inside the ball, and he's not being, I mean, terribly specific. He's just saying simple phrases. The phrases that we grew up listening, we know the right concepts about it, and so we try to make it as simple as you can for a six-year-old or a seven-year-old, and just let them swing. The older they get, the older you can be. Go ahead. I was going to say, you also have to realize, you know, he's six years old. So, yeah. I mean, he's not going to have perfected mechanics at six. I mean, at, at that age, you really want to focus on the hands. All right? You want to make sure that he's staying inside the ball because that's more important at that age than proper lower half is. And the reason I say that is because I've seen players that have, um, you know, horrible lower half but have really good hands they can still hit over 300 consistently. And it's because they stay inside the ball. Yeah. But you can have a player that has a good lower half with horrible hands, and they're still going to be a horrible hitter because yeah. they're coming around the ball every time their barrel is not in the zone long. So that's why whenever we work with young players, especially, you know, Frank, who taught me all this stuff, whenever he works with a, young, a youth player like six years old, he'll spend a month or two months on the just the hands portion of it before he even moves into the lower half. Yeah, and it's because we really want to teach how to stay inside the ball and that consistency at a young age. So right now, I mean, if he's not 
firing the lower half 100% proper right now, right. Um, I'm not too worried about it. You know, I'm, I'm more worried about is he staying inside the ball. So I would focus a lot more on the hands and teaching them how to stay inside the ball with those proper mechanics before I moved into the lower half because you also don't want to confuse them trying to do too much all at once. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's very good, too. I mean, we, we get that question fairly regularly, but I don't think we, we get to talk about it enough. Um, my smaller nine-year-olds having difficulty getting much lift with the one-hander. Is that normal? I want to keep emphasizing hand straight to the ball and not developing a swoop. Um, he typically hits down on the ball with the one-hander, not the case with the cam wood. Um, my guess is probably that he's, that he's trying to get that barrel to the ball more so than anything. What I, I mean, and we talk hand, driving the hand and pulling the hand. A lot of times kids will get in this position when we say hand, and they get like this, and then all they can do is just drop the bat on the ball. I, I go to here. The only way for my hand to move that direction is if this gets out of the way. So if that'll move in the direction of the ball that's coming to me, my hand doesn't go this direction. It goes straight to the ball. So you're talking that we need to go straight, straight, straight. Straight is going to be this direction, not so much that direction. It's not straight to the ball that's sitting on the tee, straight to the ball that's being thrown to you. So if you'll kind of give him that concept, talk to him about that, his direction's going to get a little bit straighter for real. And now the ball is going to have backspin rather than him going across and then coming around, ball going in the ground. And that was the thing, as, as I was reading the comment, the first thing that popped in my head is I would change the terminology. I would, instead of saying, you know, hand to the ball, tell him, drive your hands towards the pitcher. Mm -hmm. Because it's likely that he's seeing that ball on that tee and he's taking his hand to the ball, which uh, essentially is coming around it. All right. So what we want to do is have him focus on driving the hands towards the pitcher, because obviously in a game, that's where the ball is coming from. So. I'm sure you hear all the time, drive your hands inside the ball or, you know, knob to the ball and all that stuff. Um, they're talking about in a game, you know, the ball is coming from the pitcher, not the ball sitting on the tee. So I would change your terminology while he's doing the one hand drill to just relax the hand and see how far you can drive the hand past the ball towards the pitcher. And I think you'll start seeing a lot more line drives that way. Um, this is good too. This is interesting to me. Good point on the weight shift drill. Um, for my eight-year-old daughter, she wasn't really driving the knee, so we came up with something, a small hurdle for her to step over. Folks, that's the best thing you can do. As long as you keep the concept the same, you can find different ways to get these kids to do that drill the right way. We had a kid in here yesterday, and he was going through some conditioning stuff, but he was doing high knees. And as he was going through high knees, if you do high knees the right way and you're trying to pull the top of your knee up to the sky, that is exactly what we're simulating in the weight shift drill. We just have wider feet and we're only using one leg to do it. But they have to, they can use other things, put a hurdle in the way, put a bat down there and make them drive their knee, get their leg past that bat. Find ways to, to get them to do the drill correctly, but you've got to be careful that you don't let something like that cause them to do the drill incorrectly. If you're putting a hurdle underneath her foot or under right here in the middle of her body, she's going forward we got to make sure we control our weight and that we get our knee there, not our body there. That's interesting to me. Very good. Um, would you say, this was probably for another question we talked about, talking about warming up before games, um, doing two and twos before games, Trey. Talk about that a little bit. Or would you just go straight kind of through your drills and go right into, right into BP? Uh, before games, so I would do uh, just a little bit of each drill. I wouldn't really do two and twos. Right. But like I said, it just depends. You I, know, I, if you're I say personal preference at that point. I mean, it's your game. You're the one that's going to – you're the player. I mean, how however so, you want to feel when you get there, whatever it takes for you to feel that way, do it. So th the whole reason behind two and twos is this. We take one drill and then we move into the next, but we gradually move into the next, Okay. So when we do our one-hander, we get consistent with the one-hander, and now we introduce this new drill, the two-hand with the bigger bat. So we do two and twos because we want to take our consistency from the first drill and move it over into the second drill, if that makes sense. So essentially, I like if you are doing really well with the one-hand drill and then you move into the, the two-hand with the bigger bat and you're struggling a little bit with the bigger bat, 
with the consistency, that's when I would say, okay, now I want to do my two and twos to build that consistency into the second drill as well. So I'm good with the first, but I struggle a little bit with the second drill that we're moving into. That's where I do two and twos to just carry it over into that drill, if that makes sense. Because we're, tr we're trying to accomplish the exact same thing in those two different drills. Very good. So I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, another one here, I have a switch hitter. We talked about this before, two guys. Um, switch hitters, you don't necessarily want to double up reps. You want to go with the solid side first. So if you're a natural righty, natural lefty, train that side first. Once you train that side, then you can go into try, training the other side. You won't, don't want to get lost in two things. Um, train your strong side and then keep your strong side up. You can't let that one go to waste. Keep it up as you're training your weaker side. Um, another one here for parents who have young kids starting this. I just have to say two weeks in for my son, three weeks in for my daughter. They look terrible in week one. If you go back to the to this session three weeks ago, I was here saying my kids aren't strong enough to finish the program. I'll get my daughter's exit below this week, but my son has already seen five miles an hour in two weeks. <laughs> That's my man right there. Congratulations, James. That's awesome. That's what we like to see, though. I mean, again, he says that his kids come in here. Three weeks ago, he was saying that he didn't even think they'd be strong enough to finish the program. He didn't think they could finish the program. They're going to finish the program. His son's already seen five miles an hour increase, and no telling what his daughter's going to see when they take her exit velocity in the next few weeks as well. So that's great to hear. Yeah. That's probably like the 10,000th time we've heard stories like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, like I said, the, the program works. You just stick to it. And I, I know this because it, you know, it, it's what helped me become an All American. So I know what it did for me in my career. So I know if you stick to it, that it's going to work. I've seen it work for too many players. Can you explain further the idea philosophy of training to go oppo? And is the idea if you can do that properly, then hitting middle or pull will be naturally easy? Um, yes. I mean, normally y'all all, I mean, we always set the tee up on the outside corner. We're always focused on, especially in the 30 day program, driving the ball the other way. We talk about this, it seems to come up every week. The reason we do that is because that's the best way to teach a kid how to stay inside the ball. If you start moving the ball middle or in, you're going to allow kids to start pulling off and having to use their body to get their hands in there. So then they have too much stuff going on. They can't really focus and learn how to properly stay inside the ball. So we teach them that. Once we teach them that, it makes hitting those other pitches easier. Because of the lower half, and once they go through the program, they, they'll finally have that lower half understanding. The only difference in an outside pitch, a middle pitch, and an inside pitch is the rotation that you have to get there. The pitch is outside. You don't need near as much rotation as you do if it's inside. You've got to get your hip, your knee and hip farther inside so your hands can work where the barrel lines up with the ball. So, again, and Trey, can, I mean, Trey will talk about it too. Um, hitting an outside pitch makes hitting all these other ones easier because the other ones are – you naturally are strong to that side. You're naturally strong to the pull side. Um, once you learn how to hit the outside pitch and you learn the lower half, I think that power plays more than it does before. To your point. Yeah, I said in the pro the 30 day program, what we're teaching is one thing that's how to stay inside the ball. And if you've watched all of our stuff, you know, staying inside the ball is the most important part of hitting because it keeps our barrel in the zone for a long period of time. So, we don't have to be perfectly on time to make solid contact with the pitch. We can be a little bit late. We can be a little bit early and still barrel that ball up because we stay inside it. So the only way that you can hit an outside pitch to the opposite gap with backspin is by staying inside the ball. So that is why everything is on the outer half is because we're teaching the kids how to stay inside that pitch. <clears throat> and if you can learn how to stay inside that or, um, hit that opposite field pitch the reason that it's easier to hit the middle and the inside is because you have now learned how to stay inside the ball and like frank used to always tell me is we look away to hit the outside pitch to the right center gap but we just react to anything inside and whenever i took that approach and i really bought into that approach 
is when I became the hitter that I was in college because I could hit any no matter where you threw that ball I knew that I was going to be able to get to it and hit it hard so um I said the whole reason everything's on the outside part of the plate during this first program is because we're teaching you how to stay inside the ball and you'll see it once you move into the part two of the program we start moving the tee to the middle and then we start moving the tee inside as well because we want to teach those aspects uh, also but the first thing that we want to do is teach a kid how to stay inside the ball with those proper mechanics Well, this is going to be fun, Trey. Uh oh. Um, I know we're teaching all to the pitcher, and I'm excited about this. Uh, but I've been slow motioning a lot of MLB swings, and I see mostly swings where the front arm, bottom arm is fully pressed across their chest until the hips get to 12 o'clock. Then they forming a triangle spacing. Do we ever get to that? I'm going to just pause on talking about major league hitters because, number one, I did some research the other day. 14 major league hitters hit over 300 this year, this past season. Only 14. Out of all the major league hitters that there are, only 14 hit over 300. So let's marinate on that for a minute. Secondly, we're not necessarily teaching kids how to hit like major league players because, again, major league batting averages are atrocious. They, the philosophies that are being used right now are not proving to work. So this you're talking about, I know exactly what you're talking about because I see it too. I watch it every day where they turn their body and their hands get into somewhat of a straight barred arm and then they whip that bat around their body. All they've done is made it extremely harder to get to any pitch that's not outside. If it's outside, they wham, they barrel that sucker up and they can pull it 400 feet to left field. Start looking at that. Notice how many of those pitches are outside that are getting pulled, pulled, pulled. None of those pitches are they being able to stay inside and drive that ball the other way. It's all middle to the pull side. So, again, we don't want to get in this position ever. We want to have loose, loose hands, let our hands get to a natural firing position. And when our lower half goes, that's what folks are not understanding is the lower half is creating all of this stuff that they're trying to create with their hands. Your hands don't create it. The firing of the lower half puts your body in more of a straight position. You don't want to be here. You want to be more like this. So not here. Boom. It's so slight. Right there. That's what they're looking for. That's mm, – I see that every – I was not saying the, the term that you said is uh... – you know, they don't start the knob to the ball and or the knob to the pitcher until after the hips have cleared, which that is pretty much correct. Yeah, you know, we fire the lower half first and then the hands go inside the ball, right? So, yeah, we want to fire our hips first because it gets our hands in the position to stay inside that ball, right? So whenever the lower half fires first, then we pull the hands to the ball or towards the pitcher which stays inside that ball and the barrel whips through the zone. So essentially what you said there is correct. That's what we want to do. But we don't want to get into an arm bar where we're coming around that ball. We always want to stay inside it. Like I said, go look at guys that have notoriously hit over 300 throughout their careers like and triple crown winners like Miguel Cabrera, you know, Albert Pujols, all those guys. You will see yeah. that their focus is staying inside the ball. And it's because their barrel is in the zone for a long period of time. And I know hitting nowadays is, and I, I mean, I talk to big league uh, managers and coaches, so I know what's being taught. I just got off the phone with one yesterday that said that they're now switching back. <laughs> they took all of the uh, analytics and they took all of the yeah, stuff out of the cages. <laughs> they threw it away. Yeah. I don't want to say who it is, but yeah, um, I mean. yeah, he I said that he said the whole organization is switching back towards uh, the old school way of hitting because they noticed that the stats of like, you know, guy on third less than two out they're not getting them in and yeah. this this particular team gets to the playoffs they have one of the best records in the majors they get in the playoffs and they lose every year and it's because they don't have the right approach in the playoffs to win at the plate yeah. so um you know you'll always see and even like where we get all this stuff from is uh tony gwen and rod carew so it's, it's not like we just made this stuff up ourselves this is stuff that we learned and it got passed down to us from guys like that so you'll see tony gwynn i mean he even talks about it you know it's uh you don't swing the bat you swing the knob you know you just want to pull the knob towards the pitcher stay inside the ball right 
I mean, that's how he hit. I mean, he had what eight batting champions or eight batting titles throughout his career. So I think that guy knows a little bit about um, hitting and how to stay inside the ball. I mean, he wasn't the greatest power hitter ever, and, but, but I, the dude knew how to hit. Said that. <laughs> I watched a video of him hit the other day. We're getting a little sidetracked, but I watched a video of him hit the other day. And if you pay attention to his lower half, I, I, mm, I'll catch some heat. I don't think Tony Gwynn had a really good lower half. I don't think he had good weight shift. I think he was really just a rotational hitter in a sense. He had a stiff front side, and he got his hands there, and then he drove his hands inside the ball. He wasn't worried so much about power and hitting the ball far up in the air. He was just trying to make hard contact and hit those – Hit line drives and gaps. Through, I mean, through people's faces. And, I mean – Everybody, I mean, luckily there is a way to create power. We, I mean, through Rod Carew and Frank and all the people that we've talked to, we've learned about weight shift and driving that knee. But again, I mean, Tony's power numbers speak for itself. He, number one, he didn't really care about power. And number two, I think it speaks that his lower half, he could have had more power than he did. I, I think it was actually funny. I was watching MLB Network the other day and uh, Ken Griffey, they did an interview with Ken Griffey Jr. And they were talking about today's day and age of how everyone goes up to the plate, just tries to hit home runs. And Griffey said, I never tried to hit home runs. Like my approach at the plate was how hard can I hit a line drive yes. over the shortstop's yes. head? Mm -hmm. So he's how hard can I hit a line drive right there? And he said, the reason that I hit X amount of home runs is because I got really good extension, which like we always preach in here, yeah. power comes yeah. from extension. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to hit that line drive. He gets that good extension, that good backspin on the ball, and that creates the home runs. Right. He never tried to lift the ball in the air. He got the hands inside the ball and created that proper backspin, that proper extension through the ball, and that's what created that power. Yeah. It's the same with all these other that Miguel Cabrera can hit a ball 450 to uh, yeah. the opposite field yeah. mm -hmm. because he stays inside the ball, gets the proper extension, and gets that backspin. That yeah. makes sense. That's very good. That's very good. We'll we'll accept that tangent right there. All the drills we uh, were very clear to us, except the one hand drill. It seems that pulling the knob too far past the ball slices the ball and doesn't drive it. Also, it's a lot of stress on the arm when we isolate uh, and don't generate any momentum. I'll tell you right there. Your thoughts about setting up the tee between the legs or deeper. I'll tell you right there exactly the issues that you're dealing with because we deal this we deal with this all the time. Um, I have to talk to kids when they deal with that issue. I have to talk about their elbow because this part of their arm right here is not going anywhere. And they're doing this to the ball. And because it's not going to make it to the tee, they have to use their body to get the bat to the ball. So you've got to tell them that it has to be more of this part of the elbow. Move the elbow out of the way. Almost like somebody sitting right here next to you and I'm going to nudge them real hard. If, I'll, if the player will drive that elbow, it's going to make this bat so much lighter and it's going to move it so much faster. A lot of times they'll start that swing just like that. The elbow doesn't move and that bat gets crazy heavy out here and it is going to be a little bit hurting. It's going to be a little sore because mm, they're trying to drag that bat through the zone. We don't have to drag it. We can drive our elbow past the ball forcefully, loose and forcefully, and the bat's going to follow us in that direction. So hopefully that helps you a little bit um, with that drill. Again, like I said, we deal with kids like this all the time, and it's I mean that, that's exactly the same thing like you said right there. They're just pulling that yeah, like, far. They're trying to get it so far past the ball, and they're, they're reaching back like this. I think if, if it's slicing, so if the ball has side spin instead of back spin, it's because that front shoulder is flying off. Mm -hmm. So if, if it's a young kid – at a really young age, they pick up a bat. The bat's too heavy when they're five, six, seven years old, right? So their first instinct is to pull off of their shoulders to try to swing that bat. So at a young age, you learn those types of hobbies or habits, and they're not good. So if it has side spin off the tee, it's because that shoulder is pulling off to try to swing that bat. Where, like Jonathan says, we want to keep that shoulder closed and just drive the hand past the inside of the ball. If he keeps that shoulder closed, you're going to get that proper extension, and you're going to see backspin instead of side spin. Yep. Uh, on the tee work ball on the outside corner, front foot should be at the tee or behind the tee. Um, 
and not in front of the T, correct? It should be right, I mean, just in line. It, I mean, it's going to vary. I'll put my foot up here. It's going to vary kind of from the big toe to the – I mean, to your pinky toe, depending on the guy, the player, the girl, how long their arms are. Some, I mean, Trey can put the ball a little bit out farther out front of his front foot and still drive it to – I mean, down the right field line. Me, I didn't have as long arms. I had to bring the ball, I mean, to like my big toe, right inside my front foot. It's very dependent upon the player. But we don't want that ball getting behind that foot. If it gets behind that foot, that ball is going to foul. You're late. You're really, 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 really late. And there's no way to hit it. I'll say whenever you're hitting that outside pitch, I mean, it's easy to just set it up off that in, the inside part of your front knee. Um, you always want to hit the pitches out front because that's where you're going to get that extension. You're going to get that power from. You don't want to get beat. Right, you don't want to put the ball back in your stance and practice. Really, you're getting yourself beat. There's going to be no power there. All you can do from that position is slap the ball. So, uh, if your player on the outside pitch is having a hard time reaching that, so maybe they're a younger, uh, young player, um, instead of moving the tee back uh, in their stance, just move it closer to them. Maybe make it a, a middle out pitch instead of straight outside, so they can still reach it. Yeah, but we always want to hit off of that front uh, that front leg because we want that proper extension through the ball. Very good. Uh, this brings to another thing I've tried to do when struggling with the hands. I discovered it on myself when, for some reason, in week two I started hitting the insider rod on the open hand drill, two hand drill. I tried to fix this holding the bat so that the weight rested on the open hand and the knob was pointing to where I would eventually take it. If you can imagine, I, I kind of see what you're saying. I showed my that's son. What, that's what Frank did with me. It's kind of like, I mean, this right here, yeah. I did this to you too, I think. Yeah, like he, we, we had it straight out though. Like it was literally straight. All I yeah, would have like to do is just pull. Back. Yeah, and then I would just pull. That, yeah. That's what Frank did with me when I first started because I had the issue of coming around the ball. So he would have me literally get in that position and just pull. And that's what taught me how to pull my hands towards the pitcher inside the ball. And there's a guy that hit like that. I can't remember who it was. Um, Acuna, Acuna does, does there that. Was, there was an older guy, I think, that laid the bat. Oh, man. Kipnis. Man, older guy. Kipnis used to do it. it. That's who it is. Jason Kipnis. That's who it is. Yeah, he, he would bring it back up right before he swung, but right before like, his stance, he would start just like that. Yeah. I guess it was um, to help him not wrap it, not wrap the bat around him. This one here, can we demo the extension? I guess you're just wanting to see kind of what we're talking about. As far as when we say getting extension past the ball, if you see the T here, this T stem here, it's in line with my front foot right now. We want to see how much extension we can get this way. I got to use two hands. But I want to see how far the player can get that direction. They're never going to make, make it out here, ever, because the weight of the bat's going to be right behind them and it's going to come through there. But we're trying to get as much extension towards the pitcher the direction we, we're trying to go, where the ball is coming from, as possible. This direction. Not out here away from our body. And with the two-hander, not this kind of extension. I had a coach trying to tell one of my players the other day that the top pin is going to give you more extension. That is such a lie because it's taking your bat out of the zone. It will give you more extension the wrong way. But my bottom hand is the one that's giving you extension past the ball. That's where extension is coming from. Yeah, and we'll we'll do a video on that too, to where it's more clear. Because the way the camera is set up right now, it looked like the ball would be like far out in front of you. Yeah. So we'll we'll do a video on that, and then we'll post it inside the group chat or uh, inside the program, so you'll be able to see it. Like I said, the um the top hand in the swing is literally a guide. I mean, you don't want to be top hand dominant in the swing. I said I used to think of it as literally as just placing it on the bat. It's just along for the ride because you always want to be top or palm up, palm down through the swing, right? And then once you release that top hand at contact, uh, it's going to prevent those rollovers. So that's why you see 95% of major leaguers release top hand. It's because they want that extra extension out front, and they don't want to uh, cause rollovers and be top hand dominant. Um, this one right here is more so just a comment. The 11 U player had a decent swing to start off, started seeing results, and it kind of lit a fire. Um, it's very similar to what we talked about, Trey. It kind of gets addicting to a point to where, I mean, your results do make you want to get up at crazy times of the day or multiple times during yep. the day and go hit and go work on it and go get better at it because 
you get addicted. Oh, yeah. I mean, you get addicted to the success in a sense. Um, so yeah, that's good to see. That's just instilling work ethic in him. Um, that's, that's so awesome. Uh, yep, that, that used to happen to me. I used to take like pre-workout at midnight and go yeah. go work out. You know, do a workout and get some hitting done. It'd be at them two, three a.m. before I was yeah. done. It happens. Um, do we have any variant drill for the kids struggling with no feet, no shoulders, one hand drill? Uh, I've put kids on a bucket. I put them on their knees. I've had them ba basically take the lower half out, take the bottom portion waist down, take it out of the swing. Uh, that way they don't have the ability. Now they all they all they can really feel is doing this when they swing. We want to just feel this right here. This right here too is something else that uh, me and Brian do that I just, I'm glad he showed it to me. Look, a lot of times they're having that issue with the one hand drill, and it's because they can't keep their body still. They're trying to keep their body still with their hand and it's not allowing them to be still. The bat gets ahead of them and it pulls them around. So we basically just stand in front of them and have them hold the bat. And I'll tell them to move, to resist the bat to move. I don't want this bat to go any direction this way or this way. And basically what they're feeling is the resistance is coming from your core. It's not coming from your arms. It's coming from right here. So again, we start out, we'll put them on a bucket. I'll have them sit down and do the one-hander just like this with no lower half. And then after we get through that, we'll put them back on their feet, kind of two and twos, molding it together, one right after the other, and we stand up and do it. No, um, no feet, no shoulders, and then back down to, to a chair. Getting used to learning that I really don't need my body to take my hand to the ball. All I have to do is just drive my hand. Uh, question here for you, Trey. Can you talk about where you focus when trying to hit the ball? I know we preach backspin, so I stress to my daughter, try to hit the bottom half of the ball. Um, it's from – he said his ceiling, garage ceilings have got holes all in it from his daughter hitting smashing balls to the top of the ceiling. Looking for another way to teach her how to create backspin. Me personally, I, I never thought hit the bottom of the ball, hit the middle of the ball, hit the top of the ball. I mean, ideally, as you think about it, you want to hit the middle of the ball because it's going to create a line drive. Yep. So, I mean, Griffey talked about that whenever he did his MLB network because he tried to hit the middle of the ball and hit a line drive straight over the shortstop's head. But uh, personally, when I'm in game and stuff like that, I don't think, okay, I'm about to hit the top of this ball. No, I just, I just drive my hands naturally, and the barrel is – or the bat's going to get on plane with that pitch coming in with a slight uppercut. So essentially we're probably hitting about the, the middle bottom of the ball to hit that nice line drive, get those good backspin balls. But, you know, backspin comes from getting that good extension through the ball. So, I mean, I can chop down on a ball and get backspin, right? But it wouldn't be good mechanics. So what I want to do is make sure we get that good extension through the ball, which is going to create that good backspin. So when we're hitting off the tee, like I said, the reason that, um, we set that pitch up outside and we want to see good backspin is because whenever they get the proper extension, it's what creates that backspin. If they're flying off of their shoulder, you're going to see side spin on the ball. So we know the mechanics aren't right, if that makes sense. So, I mean, personally, I don't think, I mean, the, the base or a baseball, I guess the softball is a little bit bigger, but the baseball is so small. I don't think, okay, I need to hit the middle of this ball. I just focus on driving my hands inside that pitch and letting the bat naturally whip through the zone. And if you get the proper extension, you're going to get that backspin that you want. Yeah, absolutely. Me and Brian, literally does that make does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense to me. I mean, and it's we, me and Brian were talking about that the other day. Coaches kind of get too specific, I think, in a sense. I mean, you remember our coach? At, I mean, we've heard. If you're hitting, to, if you're hitting, beating the ball in the, in the ground, beating the ball on the ground, change your eyes. Go look at the bottom, the center of the ball. Go look at the bottom of the ball. Adjust your eyes. To me, yeah. that is so well, hard to do because the pitch is moving. The baseball is so it's, small. <laughs> it's, it's moving at 89 miles an hour, 95 miles an hour, and it's spinning at 20, whatever thousand RPMs. You want me to pick up, down, or bottom? I, all I see is the ball. <laughs> I don't see a, a ball. Yeah. I don't see the hat, the middle or the bottom. So I mean, again, we're just. 
we're looking at really the line. We're just trying to simulate the line. The bat is going to run into the ball if we drive inside of that line. I say, if you have the proper mechanics of relaxing the hands and driving the hands inside the ball, the bat's, nat the bat's naturally going to get on that plane of a natural uppercut, a slight uppercut through the zone. And, you know, you're, you're going to hit the middle, the bottom middle of the ball because it's going to create those line drives. Yeah. So if you think about a rollover, if you like literally think about how you get there and you roll the bat over, that's where you're hitting the top of the ball because the bat is making that action of coming up over the ball. And that's where you're hitting a lot of those grounders, if that makes sense. And then pop-ups obviously are hit because you're, the angle of the bats coming is too steep. So you're hitting the bottom of the ball, creating that pop-up. So if you have that, I hope that may, I mean, to me, it makes sense. But no, I mean, you're, you're right. I, I've confused people before. He said, it does, yeah. <laughs> he said, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, that's good. Man, y'all fired us up today. Lord, that was good. Any other questions, guys? We're finally to the end of our list here. It's baseball season, man. Yes, sir. Rocking. And That's softball rolling. season. I'm looking forward to the softball season. I have some – we have some stuff coming down the pipes that hopefully we'll, we'll start um, marketing a lot more softball too, yep. which will be great. Yep. A lot of practices coming, coming folks' way. Very good. Love these Zoom calls. Thank you, guys. We love them too. We enjoy them. Um, I do love the Zoom call. I, I, I do enjoy coming on here and helping y'all. Every every time we do these, Jonathan and I will text each other that. It's, yeah. <laughs> that was a great call today. Jeff, we'll we'll talk about this a bit before we go. Jeff uh, said, all this will definitely help me in, my co in coaching my team. Lots of bad hitting ideas I'm parting with. I don't think that – and Trey would probably attest, it's some of the ideas, they are bad. But a lot of things that we're seeing with, I mean, some of the, the hitting coaches who have a, a pretty good group of kids, their ideas are not necessarily bad. They're just not really understanding the concept of what we're trying to do. We're trying to hit a ball in a straight line. A lot of their, I mean, I see guys all the time saying, I mean, get your hands inside the ball, but they'll do it like this, and then they'll, then they'll cast their hands. They'll turn their body, they'll be inside, and then they'll cast their hands straight across the plate. The coaches are saying, good job. But it's because the kid took his hands to the ball. The coach don't realize that that's not the right ball we're taking our hands to. We need to be taking our hands to the ball that hadn't made it there yet. So that just kind of sparks something, too. Um, thanks, guys. No other baseball product company provides it like this. Guys, we appreciate y'all. We really do. Recorded versions can be found on the Facebook – or not the Facebook. They can be found in the Camelot The membership site. At the yeah. very bottom. This one will be up uh, very shortly. Go dogs! Lots of helpful info. I like the go dogs one. Yeah, thankful for a bucket idea. Very helpful sessions. Exactly what you're saying. They're often way too impractical, if not possibly putting the wrong focus in their minds. That's exactly right, Jeff. That's right. So that's what we're about. We're about simple things, keeping it simple, putting focus in the right place. Thank you guys. We'll see y'all next Thursday. Keep swinging your cam woods. <laughs>